welcome back to this episode of Full Spectrum Living with CBD. I am your co-host Meredith here with our hosts, Jessica and Adrian, and we're really, really excited for this episode today because we have a guest, Chris Topper, who is the lab manager at Trace Analytics. So welcome, Chris and Adrian and Jessica. Thanks, morning. Hello. Yeah, it's great to have you here today. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you, um, Chris, how you work with Bluegrass and Boil and Adrian and Jessica, how do you guys all know each other? Well, we actually test Bluegrass Hemp Oil's products here at Trace to ensure they're safe for end consumers. You know, we subject it through a, a variety of testing uh, from potency to residual solvents, microbials, uh, and basically we just ensure that the products that they're selling to the community are safe to be consumed. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, Adrian, when you and your husband got ready to open Bluegrass, and you were kind of looking at everything in the industry, testing was a big part of what you wanted to do. So help us understand why that's so important to, to you and, and really the culture of your company. They say today that CBD is the wild, wild west. Um, honestly, back when we started in 2014, it was really the wild, wild west. And even before then, um, a lot of parents were getting products sent to them from legal states and they were told by the processor, the manufacturer, that it was one thing when in truth, it was the exact opposite or quite policy. Uh, see, I fumble over words all the time. Uh, quite possibly it was um, not as pure or as clean as what it should be. You know, like Chris said, he was talking about um, microbials, pesticides. There's different things that are in the products that you don't want to be consuming. And so we thought it was very important as parents, we started advocating for testing earlier on. We started calling out other manufacturers and saying, if you're not providing tests, you're not really providing a quality product. It could quite possibly be, but it's not what you know, it's what you can show, right? It's what you can actually prove. And so we just feel it's very important in, in finding a quality lab like Trace Analytics is an important part of that process. Somebody that's trustworthy. That's awesome. And we've talked about that in other episodes, you know, that there isn't regulation and so really it's up to you as the owner of the business to make sure that you're providing things that are, are safe and meet the standards that you want to put forward. So that's awesome. And, and Chris, we're so excited to talk with you about testing and, and about that, what that looks like. So maybe you can kind of just paint a picture for us of the types of tests that you run on the, the products themselves. Sure. Um, so the most commonly uh, ordered test, I guess you could say, would be a potency test. So kind of the, the breakdown of the cannabinoids in the sample being tested, whether that be flour, a tincture, edible, bath bomb, what have you, you know. Um, there's all sorts of products out there nowadays. Uh, so potency is a big one. Microbials to the, retest the presence of, test for the presence of E. coli, salmonella, I'm sure you've heard of these before. Um, we also test for mycotoxins, which are uh, not as commonly known, but very important. Uh, these are, we test for two of, two of the more predominant ones. These are toxins produced by fungi that grow on poorly cured plant material. So little tidbit, I think moving forward, as you have these huge farms being harvested and, and warehouses curing you know, large quantities of hemp, mycotoxins could be an issue moving forward. We might see them. And uh, while they're not very commonly seen in samples, they're extremely toxic, extremely carcinogenic, and they absolutely should be tested for in, in hemp products moving forward and as this industry evolves. Um, to, keep, to keep going, we do residual solvent testing. You know, we test for the presence of ethanol or, or butane or uh, a variety of other solvents. We do pesticide testing. Uh, we screen for, I believe, over 120 pesticides at this point in time. We also test for heavy metals, uh, the primary four, cadmium, arsenic, lead, and mercury, mm -hmm. and, um, and terpene testing. We also, we also screen for at least 20 terpenes at this point yeah. in time. Oh, that's awesome. And you're, and you're doing all of that right here in, in Spokane, Washington, which is really pretty cool um, yeah. that you're able to get to that level of detail to help manufacturers really provide products that are safe and, and meet their standards. So when you think about um, the tests that you run and everything that all the knowledge that you've developed, right? What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that are out there like from consumers um, around products? 
the big one right now, uh, especially where the hemp industry is at currently, is the whole broad spectrum oil, you know, non-detectable THC, T-free oil. Uh, and there's zero a, THC. Zero T. It goes by <laughs> all sorts of these names, you know. Um, and so, as I'm sure you're all well aware, the federal limit for hemp products is less than 0.3 percent THC. Uh, they actually specify Delta 9 THC, but I won't get too much into that. So with regards to potency um, and these T-free products, now from our side, if we cannot detect the THC in the sample, it's reported as non-detected, right? T-free. Uh, the ability from one lab to another to detect a specific level varies, okay? So I've sent products to labs in Oregon uh, with, and they have what's called a, a limit of detection. So on a, mm -hmm. on a certificate of analysis, you might see capital L O D. That is the percentage of THC that a lab can reliably quantify the lowest amount. So if a lab's L O D is 0.2% THC and the sample has 0.18, the lab will report it as none detected, mm -hmm. even though it's mm -hmm. still there. And so you can see with a lab with a high LOD, uh, if a person's consuming large quantities of this product, you know, for extended periods of time and it accumulates, mm -hmm. they may run the risk of failing a urinalysis. And I would even say, like, if they're not detecting, if, if it had 0.18% THC um, milligrams per serving, you still could have, you know, a significant amount. It might not even be long-term use. It, it could be a couple of servings and that could potentially show up on a drug test. Um, Chris and I had this conversation in preparation for the podcast. And I think that's a really big issue. And we've kind of, Adrian, um, and I have kind of noticed this trend of places putting zero THC and then you look into it and it's like zero point something, something, THC, which is not zero THC. And, and mm -hmm. to Chris's point, that could cost someone their job uh, if that limit of detection is, is okay. too high. Sure. So then that raises actually, sorry, that raises a question for me. So the limit of detection is not standardized from lab to lab, right? Is that what I'm understanding? Absolutely. So, and I think that that's very interesting because a, a manufacturer who wants to sell a 0% or a zero THC you know, product could quite possibly do so by just choosing, quote unquote, the right lab. Right. Exactly. Right? Does yes. that also vary per state? Or I mean, is it just across the board nationally, there's no standard for a limit of detection or are there different ones per state or? No, at, the, at this point in time, due to the unregulated wow. nature of the industry, there is no standardized wow. testing. Now we're actually working with the, the USDA and we've actually just applied for a DEA license uh, to kind of spearhead the, the hemp testing protocol moving wow. forward. Wow. Um, so I believe for our hemp testing, our, our limit of detection is 0.02%. Wow. And okay. I know Fair a lot enough. of labs are around 0.2, you know, mm -hmm. so it's 10 times lower than the legal limit. Mm -hmm. And I, in the years I've been using Trace, uh, I've never known of anybody consuming a, a product that was T-free, blessed off by us, ever having an issue, so. Um. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I just thought it was really interesting. Like we, we see that so often. Uh, how would a consumer know what that level of detection is? Is it listed on the lab results or uh, do you have to call and ask them? Or? You may have to call and ask. Um, certain labs will, will post this information on the certificate of analysis. You might see the actual numbers, you know, in one column, and then you might see like in faded ink, what their limits of detection are. Uh, if not though, um, I, I believe labs are, are, are mandated to divulge that information okay. if, if questions. I don't, I don't think it's proprietary in any okay. sense. Okay. So uh, I would encourage consumers, you know, if, if or or processors, other manufacturers, if you're doing business with a with a company, find out who they're testing with and find out what the lab's capabilities mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you feel like in the industry people are open with that information, or is it something that's just kind of brushed under the carpet a little bit, kind of more down, you know, on the down low. I'd say, I, honestly, I'd say maybe it's 50, 50, you know, um, I, th I think a couple of years ago, uh, everyone, even including the, uh, us on the analytical side, everyone's kind of feeling out the industry, developing new methods, getting more precise, more accurate, more sensitive. 
Uh, nowadays, I think the consumer is better educated and a lot, a lot of them are more aware of, of issues like this. And so uh, it's trending in the right direction. The, the, the issue is there's no regulatory agency mm -hmm. saying, no, you have to mm -hmm. operate like this, you know? So it's kind of up to us and up to you guys to it absolutely, employ best practices. It, it really absolutely is. And I, I would like to just say to the consumer who may be listening, like, ask for lab tests. <laughs> we are happy to provide them. Um, any company that has uh, standardized this process and, and uh, been authentic in their testing process would be happy to provide them. But, mm -hmm. you know, I never get asked for labs. We have them posted in, in the store and no one asks. They, they want to know that you have labs. But if you say, yeah, I've got labs, that's good enough for most people. And I think they should uh, really as a consumer, um, not be so quick to accept uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that answer from most places. <laughs> well, and I think, but it's also, it's, it's not for the average person so easy to read or to understand, you know, how do they know every lab test is going to look different from every other lab. Um, so how do they know what to look out for? You know, as someone who's in the business, of course I do, but Chris is, if you were going to instruct someone who was kind of new into CBD, what would you tell them to look for first? And how to like how to read the lab at least a little bit. Sure, sure. So, so the biggest the, the big thing I've seen in in the hemp side of things, uh, especially with isolates and and distillates, um, more so from like processor to processor sales, is I'll get a COA for let's say isolate, and you know the the cannabinoid profile is up top, great, and then below you know there, there's eighty to hundred pesticides listed, and they all have the letters N T next to it. Uh, what that means is they were not tested. It does not mean no trace. So while while they're populating the COA to look like all these things were tested for and it's all clean, it's not, not the case. Now that's kind of like a little marketing, yeah. you know, a little salesy thing <laughs> mm -hmm. going on. But uh, you, you want to see, and, and on the COAs, you'll, the acronyms like NT, if you look at the bottom, it will say NT equals not tested. So if you're, you have any questions on the letters used on these certificates of analysis, usually they're in a legend somewhere on it. And if you're confused, call your processor, call the lab um, and ask them to, you know, elaborate. But And just to clarify, ND would mean not detected. Not correct? detected. Which, uh, so that's which, a little which, tricky. <laughs> which, means, which means whatever whatever was being tested for, showed up less than the lab's ability, the, less than the lab's limit of detection, right? So um, I don't think there's any perfect test out there or perfect system that can guarantee absolutely zero. Mm -hmm. But as, as far as I know, 0.02%, I, I don't know anyone lower than that mm -hmm. at this, mm -hmm. this point. Well, well and and it, makes, it makes me think, you know, um, why, why are we testing hemp this way when we're not like testing the corn that goes into our food? So what's different about hemp and its ability to maybe absorb all of these things and the, the need for testing. You were, you were talking about that a little bit before we started recording today that hemp is, you know, used for some specific purposes and has some specific properties that maybe make this testing even more important. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so pr microbial potency, residual solvents, those are all pretty standard tests. Um, the tests that are not mandated and often overlooked would be pesticides and heavy metals. Uh, mm -hmm. I think pesticides is going to be more of an issue moving forward as due to the passage of the farm bill, you have more and more, you know, farmers cultivating hemp, bigger and bigger fields. So the likelihood of pesticide drift from the tomato farm down the road increases, mm -hmm. right? Um, furthermore, when you're processing hemp and you're concentrating the cannabinoids, certain pesticides can also be concentrated at the same time during that process. Uh, so pesticides are very important to be looking for test results regarding them. Heavy metals is an interesting one and kind of unique to cannabis. So the hemp plant itself is phenomenal and as actually known in the scientific and industrial community for phytoremediation. And what that means is the plant uh, can absorb pollutants and toxins from the soil uh, and, and basically kind of refresh the soil for, for a new crop later down the line. Uh, fun fact, actually, they, they, in Ukraine, they planted a bunch of hemp following the Chernobyl accident to absorb the radiation out of the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
this is not a, a, a new practice. You know, they've used shrubs in the past, but hemp is unique in that the roots can go about three feet into the soil. And so the reme it, it's got depth to its remediation. It won't just remediate the top six inches. It can really remediate mm -hmm. that soil. Oh. I think to, to draw the significance of that, um, of course, you know, you don't want those byproducts in your um, plant or your extract material. Uh, but also I think as the industry grows and people are looking to replace, you know, tobacco crop or a soybean field, then, you know, the mass production and scale of this is leading to, it is going to clean a lot of soils that were not you know, treated organically. It is going to leach those toxins and being known as a bioaccumulator and, and soil cleaner, um, I think it's a matter of time or possibly already happening that it's being used to clean soil and the CBD that's a byproduct of that is then cashed in on as well. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it, it just becomes more and more important to make sure that that testing is done. Uh, so you know, you know how it was grown in the sourcing. Um, I also wanted to touch on when you were talking about the processing, just something else happening that we've seen a lot is the practice of baling your hemp like hay. It's not hay, it shouldn't be baled, it does need to be cured. And the mycotoxin issue uh, likely would be really exacerbated by baling your hay and letting it not cure completely. So sure. just want to kind of touch on that as the significance of Right, know, right, right. Stagnant airflow and water all locked up in that bale, you know, and and there's no, I guess, best practices at this point, you know, everyone's trying to figure out what's the best way to cure, you know, and, and we're getting into larger and larger quantities mm -hmm. and it's all new territory, you know, higher so demand. higher yeah. demand. I mean, so we all got to kind of, I, I, I really feel like, you know, help each other evolve in this industry and, and people who want to push it in the right direction, get together and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and educate you know, the, uh, the industry. For sure. I mean, and that's, I think what Jessica and Adrian have been wanting to do with this show, you know, is to, is to just share information exactly like this, because the more we know, um, the better choices we can make. And the, the higher standard that the consumer has, like Adrian mentioned, when we started in 2014, we were lab testing independently. We had, uh, in-house labs that we were trying to, um, work with as well uh, so just on our own end but having it validated by a third party we've always done that uh, but it was not at all standard practice until the consumer kind of got wind that like it should be mm -hmm. we started demanding it and now everywhere has labs how authentic they are and what they're tested for and and then the marketing the misleading that can sometimes happen behind that is a whole another topic but um the consumers pushed for labs and it became kind of standard not because it was required, but because people asked for it. So I think the more they know to ask for, the more likely this pesticide and heavy metals testing is when it doesn't necessarily always happen otherwise. Well, I think there's also been a lot of investigative reporting where um, reporters have just pulled products off of shelves and sent them off to labs to test. And I mean, even on the very basic level of is the amount of CBD that's on the label in the product, we've seen by far and by far and large that it's just not happening right you can't even get cbd much less thinking about the other possible things that are in there from pesticides or microbials or mycotoxins let's just talk about can i at least get the cbd that you're promising me that i'm buying so there's i think a definite need for consumers to be um to advocate for themselves mm -hmm. and to really look into what's in the products that they're purchasing well, and that brings me to Jessica, you said that you don't get a ton of questions about the labs specifically, but when you do get questions from your customers coming into the store or, you know, from your customers online, what are they asking about? Yeah. Uh, so I think the, so for one, again, I don't get many questions on labs and that's unfortunate. So please start asking <laughs> consumers. <laughs> um, but when I do get questions, one common misconception that I get is um, there's two columns listed on the potency test. And one I think is the milligrams per grams um, and one is the percentage. And could you kind of explain like the difference between those two columns and um, like what you would look for to make sure it has a federal legal limit of THC? So the the milligram per gram is kind of how we interpret the data off the instruments. Um, and then we convert that to a percentage by weight, uh, just because that seems to be the, the common manner in which this information is being given to the public. Uh, so as far as a federally, federally legal hemp product, you, they're only mandating uh, 
Delta 9 THC be less than 0.3%. Uh, not to trip up the consumer or the listener, but there's another version of THC called Delta 8, which is not regulated or looked at by the USDA or DEA at this point in time. And so while one's products could have 0.2% Delta 9 and 0.2% Delta 8, technically that's 0.4% THC. But the way the law is written right now, that's a legal product. So that also can muddy the waters as far as, well, this is a, a full spectrum, so it's less than 0.3 THC, but am I gonna be okay with a urinalysis? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. So on, on, on the COA, while you're looking at those two columns and the, the cannabinoids, you should see a, a D9-THC, and you wanna also see a D8 dash THC. So keep an eye out for both of them. And then I think on the same topic here, um, you know, THC and THCA are listed separately, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but as a whole, I've seen some debate online. I think I know the answer, but if you could clarify, like, um, are you for the allowable 0.3% THC max of Delta 9? That includes THCA and decarboxylated THC as well? As far as the, the regulatory uh, framework, they are taking the, the 0.87 times mass of the THCA and calling that THC. So after it loses its, after it decarboxylates mm -hmm. and loses a CO2 molecule, uh, that's where the 0.13% the comes from there. But um, the, as far as most of the hemp products are, are tincture based or edible based, right? Uh, ingesting that THCA is not going to um, uh, aggravate popping hot on a UA, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, now, if you smoked it, then it decarboxylates. Mm -hmm. Now it's THC and that will trip up the, the drug test. Okay. So it's called without getting too complicated. Okay. So I have, a, I have a question. So without naming names of companies, just to kind of educate the audience, what's kind of the worst thing or the, some of the scariest things that you've seen in, in <laughs> products that have been tested by your lab? Yeah, yeah. So, so consumers, you should be asking for, for certificates of analysis <laughs> okay. because this is unregulated in the Wild West and not every manufacturer you know, or, or person in the industry has everyone's best intentions in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst thing I've seen um, was it was some CBG oil or CBD oil uh, and it had about 20,000 parts per million PPM of chloroform. Uh, now this is a chemical used in the civil war to knock out soldiers before wow. they hacked their limbs <laughs> off with assault. Uh, wow. The wow. OSHA, uh, the government's daily limit, like exposure limit is two. This had 20,000 oh PPM in it. Uh, oh, wow. Extremely wow. dangerous. And yeah, I've seen extracts with failing levels of isopropyl alcohol mm -hmm. left over. Mm -hmm pesticides out to wazoo, mm -hmm. lead, arsenic, mercury. Um, lead's pretty common just because a lot of manufacturers, uh, as they're scaling up, are buying old used equipment from like the 70s and 80s and lead's leaching out of the metals. You know, uh, I've, seen a, I've seen a lot in capsules, um, just to, wow. you know, more to follow, you know, as I kind of observe these but trends. Then do you know, like, do you know afterwards if those products have actually gone to market? I mean, that's, you know, that's one thing to test it, but you don't, you don't really know after that, like if they took that chloroform filled product and like went ahead and sold it anyway. Wow. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it did happen, wow. you know, uh, and that's the scary part of not having any regulatory oversight. Mm -hmm. So I think- So there's like, if you saw something like that happen, there's nowhere to really report it, or I mean, it's just on them, what they do with the results that you find, even if it is something you find is toxic. It's still on them. Yeah, right. Guess. Yeah. Okay. And I, I wow. guess the best we can hope for is just, you know, the, the right processors, the right farmers, people mm -hmm. who want to do it clean and proper, you know, that they find each other and work together moving mm -hmm. forward. You know, I think that's yeah. at this point the best we can hope for. Yeah. That's huge because that, I mean, that's really echoing Jessica and Adrian, what you guys have been sharing as a part of this, this show and these episodes is that, you know, it really is the wild west and you really do need to, it really is a case of buyer beware. So before we wrap up today, Chris, um, maybe tell us what you're most excited about in the, in the industry right now. Like, what are you, what are you really, um, happy to see happening or, you know, that you're really looking forward to, um, in this next year? Well, I'm, I'm, 
the the number of of processors and farmers and labs and you know and even retailers uh, demanding testing or you know um, a demonstration that a product has that amount of CBD in it or has less than X amount of THC that number of people are, is increasing which is very looks is very promising it looks very good I'm optimistic about that and hopefully that trend will continue um, most of my exciting projects are on the processing side of things, mm -hmm. isolating certain cannabinoids, you know, converting cannabinoids from one to another, but that's a talk for another time. Excellent. Awesome. Can I, can I add one question that I really yeah. wanted to cover before? Um, so could you quickly address um, any misconceptions that may be involved around the hydrocarbon processing? We do hydrocarbon process with our uh, company and we've had it tested through you guys for a long time. We know it's very safe, but, um, you know, do you have any experience with hydrocarbons? Any um, anything to share on that kind of processing and the stigma associated? I, I think, yeah. So, from uh, from a scientist's perspective mm -hmm. and a chemist, the the poisons in the dosage, whether that be water or oxygen, you know, or orange juice. I mean, anything can kill you in a specific quantity. Okay. <laughs> so, the fact that if you're using a solvent to extract a compound and you get the end product tested and the solvent's not there what's the issue, right? Mm -hmm. at, the, the, at that point, the conversation might be tailored to, well, how about the safety of the extraction process? Mm -hmm. In that sense, hydrocarbons can be a little bit more dangerous than ethanol and even and CO2 is even less more so. But if, if it's not in the end product, it's not there. Mm -hmm. So there should be no, no cause for concern mm -hmm. so long as it's not detected, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I just, I really wanted to just get something out on that because it is a, a huge issue that we face is um, people hear butane and it's just easy to get scared. So I think it's great to just get the, the validation of like, if it's not there, it's not there <laughs> and it's never there. So <laughs> and, our, and uh, since you guys are testing with us, our limit of detection mm -hmm. for butane is one parts per million. Wow. I mean, it doesn't, can't really go much lower than wow. that. And so yeah. when, on your COAs, when you see ND, it means it's less than it one PPM. actually is not it's there. Zero, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, yeah, thank you for that. That's, I mean, that's fantastic. And I'd honestly even go back to the safety of the extraction process itself. I'd say if you have a butane spill, it's essentially gone in the moment, um, as opposed to an ethanol spill, then what do you do the cleanup and, and the absorption and everything else? I think the, uh, the stigma around the unsafetyness that's not even a word, but of, uh, of a butane or hydrocarbon um, extraction method is goes back to people doing it improperly or poorly, right? Not in a closed loop situation. Right. So that's just my right. my little and, zing on the end there, but. You know, and, and, and that, that, this whole stigma, even though we're still dealing with residuals mm -hmm. six years later, mm -hmm. came about in 20, you know, 2010, 2014, people, you know, open blasting in the backyard, mm -hmm. you know, and just people right. who should have no business yep. doing this, these things, we're <laughs> Not doing using them. using proper and, procedures at right, all. Right. Know, nowadays, it's all engineer, peer reviewed, <laughs> closed loop systems, right. you know, right. 304 yep. stainless steel, Absolutely. you know, explosion proof everything, yeah. you know, and, 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 and fortunately the industry is attracting, you know, like recent, you know, chemists and, and mm -hmm. engineers, you know, yep. and so yep. I think the, the quality of products is only going to get better, you know, mm -hmm. just we as, you know, uh, people in the industry uh, just need to emphasize to the consumer demand mm -hmm. a higher quality product, mm -hmm. just demand it, you know, put the pressure on us and on, on yes. the in, you yes. know, industry to, to get better. Absolutely. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if anyone wanted to find out a little bit more about Bluegrass and Boil and the work that you all are doing, Adrian, where would be a good place for them to find more information? Absolutely. Check us out on our website, bluegrasshempoil.com or follow us on our social media. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you all for being here and a special thanks to you, Chris, for joining us today. For this episode of Full Spectrum Living with CBD, I'm your co-host Meredith here with Jessica and Adrian, and we will see you all the next time. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.